here in his old cardiology. Um, I'm sure you all know that he recently uh, joined us from uh, Brown University and he leads the uh, laboratory here um, in CCLD. And he will talk to us today about new diagnostics and therapeutics for diastolic heart failure. So, Thank Dr. Gavin. Thank you, Gavin. Yes, uh, I am also, first of all, I'm just excited to be here, but I'm also very excited about the seminar series. We have some really uh, great people coming, so please, uh, Please come, please attend, please get involved. Um, by October, we will be uh, video conferencing all of the cardiology grand round lectures here and all of the LHI lectures um, to VCRC, and everything will be recorded so that you can um, you can watch it later. You know, uh, podcast if you can't uh, actually attend. So uh, please uh, please get involved. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, with that, um, I, I'm, if uh, if you know anything about my history, which you necessarily not necessarily should, um, I, I was trained as a cardiac electrophysiologist. So, um, I remember writing my first grant about diastolic uh, heart failure, um, and one of the reviewers was so kind as to comment that an electrophysiologist has no business studying heart failure. Like, well, that's a little bit of an opinion, but uh, I did come up with the data. So I, I thought what I would do is uh, to uh, share this data with you. So my lab does really two things, um, diastolic heart failure and arrhythmic risk. Um, we have diagnostics and therapeutics in both of those areas that are um, uh, making their way to human clinical, um, some are in human clinical trials, some have already had proof of concept in man. And uh, so, uh, that's kind of what I do, and I will share half of what we do uh, in the lab with you today. Um, so with that, I have to point out that um, the therapies that I am going to be discussing are not, uh, are not, oh, it's wandered somewhere. That's why it's here. Okay, how did it get there? Uh, it's, it's like, this is apps and snake. Okay, uh, sorry about all that. Um, so the the therapies that we're going to be talking about are not approved, so you cannot use them on your dogs or cats or even patients. Um, and I do have some intellectual property rights associated with this, so but I'll try not to be too conflicted about the whole thing. Um, just in case you don't know, there are actually two types of heart failure. Um, there's one, the systolic heart failure, where the heart fails to contract. Um, that no blood goes out because the pump doesn't work very well. Uh, fluid builds up into the lungs and into the legs, and you can't breathe. Um, there's another type of heart failure where, in fact, the heart squeezes just fine. It just doesn't relax well. So you can't fill the chamber in diastole. So even though it squeezes, there's not much in there going out. So the net effect is exactly the same. There's uh, this buildup of blood behind the heart into the lungs and down into the periphery. Um, and in fact, uh, you cannot tell the difference between these two uh, types of heart failure on physical exam. So um, they have exactly the same symptoms. Uh, so I just wanted to point it out so we're all on the same page. There's, uh, uh, and, and in the clinical nomenclature, these are called HEF-REF and HEF-PEF, or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, there's also another kind of interesting feature about uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, that is that um, there's this very long latency where people have a failure of the heart to relax, and that can be easily demonstrated. That's called diastolic dysfunction, but they don't have heart failure symptoms. And so there's, there's kind of a two-hit problem here before you get the clinical scenario. There's this diastolic dysfunction which underlies the, the heart failure, and then there's something else that pushes you into the symptomatic phase. Um, and so if you could uh, find therapies for this disease, you could treat it in its latent phase and, in fact, prevent heart failure completely. Um, and I also want to point out these are some of the risk factors for, uh, for diastolic heart failure, um, and, and we'll uh, sort of come back to those uh, over, over time. If you're going to diagnose diastolic heart failure, you have to measure diastole. So uh, the classic way to do that is put catheters into the heart and measure pressure. 
So these are pressure volume loops. Uh, so under normal circumstances, you have isovolumic contraction, ejection, isovolumic relaxation, and filling. Okay, uh, and, and you go like this, and if you integrate the area under there, that's cardiac work. Uh, so, uh, and in diastolic heart failure, in systolic heart failure, what happens is the, the, um, the systolic, uh, end diastolic pressure, the end systolic pressure volume relationship is shifted downwards. That is, you just can't generate as much pressure at any given volume. So uh, you eject less blood, and you have increased pressure um, in diastole as well. So you get this reduced ejection fraction. Between here and here is ejection fraction. You get a reduced ejection fraction uh, because your systolic pressure volume relationship isn't working right. Um, in diastolic heart failure, your systolic function's fine. Um, it's just you don't relax. So for any given volume in the chamber, there's an increased pressure, and that pressure is transmitted back to the lungs, and you can't breathe. Um, so uh, we can do this. We can do this on mice. We can do this on people. Um, it's uh, a little uh, time-consuming and invasive. So uh, most people diagnose diastolic dysfunction using echocardiography. So uh, it, um, this is the kind of, so we look at mitral flow velocity. So this is flow velocity across the mitral valve. So it has an uh, <coughs> early phase when the mitral valve first opens, and then a, another phase of increased velocity when the left atrium contracts. So that's E for early, A for, uh, um, for atrium. And you can also measure, instead of measuring velocity of blood flow across the mitral valve, you can measure excursion of the mitral valve uh, annulus itself. So now you're measuring the myocardium. And it also has an early phase and an atrial contraction phase. So this is... Uh, usually called E prime and A prime, or E M for muscle or mitral, and A for uh, uh, A for atrial, and then M for mitral. Um, so uh, diastolic dysfunction comes uh, in three flavors by echocardiography. Um, there's grade one, grade two, and grade three, and they have various characteristics of the E to, a, e to A ratios and E prime to A prime ratios. So <clears throat> for this, uh, the key thing feature that you need to know is that under normal circumstances, the E is big and the A is small. And when you have diastolic dysfunction, the E is small and the A is bigger. Okay? And we'll make use of that. Um, and th this we do, you know, all the time in humans. So um, you can do it in mice. Um, yeah, of course. Yes. So I will get to that, and I will show it to you, but uh, um, because we will, we will <clears throat> drill down into mechanisms. But um, the short answer is yes, um, with one caveat. There are probably more than one type of diastolic dysfunction. There's a functional type, which is what we're going to talk about today because it actually has potential therapies. There's an age-related phenotype that's really fibrotic in nature and is not as easily reversible, and that has nothing to do with the myocytes. That has all to do with fibrosis. Um, and, and, you know, whether humans, when they present with diastolic dysfunction, have combinations of these two isn't well known. So, um, you know, it's something that uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we might be able to set up a, um, a center of excellence in diastolic heart failure, and, and then we could do some of this characterization. But um, <clears throat> so we'll see. Uh, as you know, we're in our strategic planning process, and we'll vet a whole bunch of ideas and pick the three best ones to invest in. Yes. Um, well, you can make you can make inferences about atrial pressure from echocardiogram, but you're not measuring it directly. Um, you can certainly do this if you want to do pressure volume loops. You can, right? The, when the mitral valve is open, you are measuring left atrial pressure as as well as left ventricular pressure. So um, you can, um, but uh, on a routine basis, we do not or have not. I mean, maybe. You, important to do for your research, and we can certainly talk about it, and we can do it. Um, so I just wanted to drive home. Everyone thinks about systolic heart failure, and we are, we are a real center of excellence in systolic heart failure. I mean, we do, you know, uh, 35, 40 VADs a year. We've done more than 500 left ventricular cyst devices overall. That's 
for the people that don't get the acronyms, that's artificial hearts. Um, and then we transplant about 30 people a year, which is really pretty good for, <clears throat> um, for a program. So uh, we are um, doing really well in managing our um, systolic heart failure. <clears throat> but there's this other type, diastolic heart failure. And it turns out to be half of all heart failure in the world. So we're spending this huge amount of effort. We're known for taking care of half of all the heart failure. Um, so uh, it's uh, equally mortal to systolic heart failure. So uh, when I was in training, they said, no, no, diastolic heart failure, it doesn't matter. You know, just give them some diuretics. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> but um, And if I were to do this, and I, I, I promised myself I would do it one day, um, that mortality curve is uh, exactly equivalent to stage 3 lung, squamous cell lung carcinoma. So uh, when I walk into a room and I say, well, you have heart failure, they're like, okay, doc, what do we do about it? And, you know, I walk into a room and say, you have lung cancer, you know, people start writing their will and calling it. Um, but they're equally um, unhappy outcomes unmanaged. So, you know, 30% survival in five years. Uh, so it's, it's not a trivial disease. Um, uh, we are doing better at managing systolic, uh, um, systolic heart failure, uh, but we are not doing better on managing diastolic heart failure. In fact, uh, I'm going to show you, there are no therapies um, for diastolic heart failure. So this is it. This is all the things we can do for systolic heart failure. And we spend lots and lots and lots of time uh, in the clinic and in the hospital doing these things. This is uh, uh, resynchronization therapy with pacemakers, implanted defibrillators, you know, transplant. Uh, I don't have VADs in there, but I should. Um, and this is it. This is all we have for diastolic heart failure. And none of those things change outcome. None of those change, change mortality. And none of them treat the underlying disease. So. Um, you know, we're, we're doing really well over here. Um, and Jay Cohn was very um, early in vasodilation for treatment of heart failure, which has turned out to be a huge boon and a, uh, um, and, and a big uh, change in mortality for people with heart failure. But we have nothing for diastolic heart failure at, at all. So um, I just want to quickly review some things that people have tried. Um, there was this concept that diastolic heart failure was somehow just a variant form of systolic heart failure. So it must be, then, if that is true, that if we use the drugs that work in systolic heart failure, they should work in diastolic heart failure. Well, guess what? They don't. So this is, this is uh, ACE inhibitor. doesn't work. Um, so you know, mainstay of therapy for systolic heart failure doesn't work in diastolic heart failure. This is uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, two different types. Don't work. Um, uh, beta blockers, digoxin. None of them work. Um, sildenafil doesn't work. Uh, Spironolactone may be very small effect in top cat trial, but not, not particularly outstanding. Um, so here's just a list I made a, a year or two ago of all the trials that have failed. So every single one of these drugs has activity in systolic heart failure. None of them work in diastolic heart failure. So I don't know. When I was, you know, an electrophysiologist looking at this field, I'm like, what are you guys doing? I mean, how many times do you have to get the notice that it, it, they're not related before you stop and do something else? Um, so um, very much like uh, Rene Marguerite, I tried to look at the situation from a little different uh, perspective. Um, so before uh, I share that perspective with you, uh, oh, yes. Um, so the first thing I did was just look at the epidemiology of, of diastolic heart failure. So, um, I, and I would like to stress that there, there is no one good type of science, and they can all feed on each other. So this entire project and everything that came out of it started with some simple epidemiology. Um, so uh, this is, these are the risk factors for coronary artery disease. Pretty well known, right? Um, nothing surprising there. Look at the risk factors for diastolic heart failure. They're almost identical. So um, to me, I looked at this and said, well, wait a minute. If the risk factors are similar, then maybe the pathology is similar. And then you, all you had to do was kind of think about, well, you know, the heart is a blood vessel. It's sort of ugly and folded up, but it is a blood vessel. And maybe it responds just like all the other blood vessels to um, various stressors. Obviously, you don't get atherosclerotic plaques, but maybe the other stuff is very similar. So in vascular biology, these are very common concepts that you, you are a happy person 
if you have lots of nitric oxide and uh, very little reactive oxygen species. And you become a very unhappy person that is, uh, when you have atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, all these things, um, you actually have a reverse, you are now an oxidized person. Um, and we've measured this in the blood, and we can teach anyone who wants to do it how to do it. Um, you have too much reactive oxygen species and not enough nitric oxide. So these, kind of, these two things kind of um, play off each other. <clears throat> Uh, and one more thing I have to teach you before we go uh, through the data set is uh, this guy. This is, um, this is some characterization or cartoon of endothelium, uh, um, of sorry, ENOS, uh, um, nitric oxide synthase. Um, it comes in three flavors, E, N, um, which one am I forgetting? I. Um, inducible, endothelial, and uh, neuronal. Um, so uh, it turns out that in heart, uh, it's almost all ENOS and a little bit of NOS. There's not much INOS. Um, nitric oxide synthase takes arginine and converts it to citrulline and nitric oxide. It does that through an electron transport chain that involves this uh, little cofactor called BH4 or tetrahydrobiopter. Um, if this thing doesn't exist or is in an oxidized form, what will happen is the electrons will get stuck up here and they will go on the only thing that they can find, which is molecular oxygen producing superoxide. So nitric oxide, when it's in its normal form, will produce NO. Nitric, that's good for you, um, vasodilator. If, if nitric oxide is what's called uncoupled, um, it will not only stop producing nitric oxide, it will start producing reactive oxygen species. That is bad for you. So nitric oxide has all these good things that it does for you. Um, so we made a simple hypothesis, just based on the, the um, epidemiology, that um, we knew that in blood vessels, hypertension is associated with increased uh, reactive oxygen species. That oxidizes your BH4. That creates uncoupled nitric oxide synthase. That reduces NO. And then you kind of get stuck in this cycle. So now you don't have the vasodilator. You get more hypertension and so forth. So this is a very classic paradigm in vascular biology. All we said was, well, maybe the same thing happens in the heart. Um, so not, not, you know, not particularly outstanding leap of faith here. Um, and then we said, well, if that's true, then nitric oxide, uh, the lack of nitric oxide would give you um, diastolic heart failure or diastolic dysfunction. And if, it, if this hypothesis is true, it also gives you two treatment options. You, you um, can recouple your nitric oxide synthase or you can get rid of your uh, excess reactive oxygen species. So now I'm going to show you that this hypothesis actually works. Um, in diastolic heart failure. So uh, the first thing we do, had to do is develop a model of diastolic heart failure, not trivial. It took about five years to get it right. Um, so uh, it's a hypertension-based model of, of uh, heart failure, but very mild hypertension, not like the vascular biology guys do where they, you know, the blood pressure of 200 or something. Um, and you will get these characteristics. You will have... Uh, um, uh, Diastolic dysfunction with preserved ejection fraction and no valvular abnormalities. Um, so I'm going to try to convince you that that's true. So here are echocardiographic measures of diastolic. Uh, um, sorry, you guys on the other end of the room. I'm, I'm right-handed, so I tend to point over this side. But um, maybe you'll forgive me. Um, so this is uh, a color flow Doppler of, um, of flow through the mitral valve uh, as a function of time. And so... If relaxation is fast, the blood flow will move from the atrium to the ventricle rapidly. And so there will be a, a, a fairly um, steep slope. Um, uh, and if there is a diminishment in this slope, this is one. Um, uh, flow, it's called flow velocity, mitral flow velocity. Um, that's consistent with diastolic heart failure. Remember we talked about this reversal in the E to A ratios. This happens to be tissue Doppler E prime to A prime. Um, the mouse does not get a reversal in the E to A ratio, the mitral flow velocities. This, um, this is classic of grade 2 diastolic dysfunction in humans. So it's called pseudonormal or um, grade 2 diastolic dysfunction. Okay. So um, reviewers said, well, this, you know, I don't believe echo. I like my favorite tool. So um, here are the pressure volume loops. The systolic and systolic pressure volume relationship is identical. Systolic function is normal. The, and 
diastolic pressure volume relationship is much steeper than in the black controls here. And that's just uh, um, quantified down here. Uh, oh, this is the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which is elevated, as you might expect. So, um, so by uh, Doppler and by um, hemodynamics, um, these mice have diastolic dysfunction. Um, this diastolic dysfunction is accompanied by no changes in calcium handling. There are no changes in uh, resting diastolic calcium. There are no changes in the calcium peak transient. There are no changes in how fast the transient is taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, so this is not a disease of calcium handling. This is exactly opposite of systolic dysfunction. In systolic dysfunction, the basic defect is too little calcium release from the sarcoplasmic particular. Uh, now, once I say that, now every, everyone has their opinion about why that happens. But the bottom line is there's less calcium coming out of the sarcoplasmic particular, and there's less contraction, and there's less force generation. Um, that is absolutely not true in diastolic dysfunction, at least in our hands. And, and that's probably why the drugs that work for systolic dysfunction don't work in diastolic dysfunction. But, um, Anyway, um, so now I'm going to show you that uh, I've characterized the model. There is a model. It has isolated diastolic dysfunction. Now we're going to try to get the diastolic dysfunction to go away. Um, so uh, before I do that, I wanted, uh, oh, yes. So this is an ethidium bromide complexation technique. This is a one way of measuring superoxide production. There, there are a ton of different ways to do this, so, um, you know, whatever. Um, but... Uh, there's a relatively small amount of, of superoxide production controls. This goes up in the hypertensive diastolic dysfunction mice, and, and this is reverted to normal with addition of BH4, feeding the mice orally BH4. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is consistent with BH4 being elevated in the myocardium of these mice. So if you feed them BH4, um, if you make them diastolic dysfunction, the BH4 goes away in the heart, and if you feed them back the BH4, it goes back to the heart. Um, now, uh, so uh, I've told you that you can feed mice BH4, and that will make the amount of oxidative stress in the heart go down, and it will make the amount of nitric oxide in the heart go up. But does it do anything for diastolic heart failure? Um, so here's the data. Um, the classic way of measuring... Um, uh, diastolic dysfunction that is relatively load independent um, is used the E to E prime ratio uh, um, from the echocardiogram. And uh, the E to E prime ratio is unchanged if you treat sham animals with BH4. So BH4 doesn't do anything to a, a, a normal animal. Um, if you make the animal hypertensive and have diastolic dysfunction, the E, the e prime goes up just as it's supposed to with diastolic dysfunction. And if you treat those animals with BH4, it gets better again. Um, this is also at the so this is the whole animal um, echocardiogram. This is at the cellular level. So now we're looking at the relaxation constant of the of the myocyte. So we contract it and then we look at how fast it relaxes. Um, so uh, the sham animals, nothing happens with BH4. The animals that are hypertensive, their myocytes don't relax well, um, even individually. So these are individual isolated myocytes. Uh, and they get better with BH4. And if you want to measure um, this in terms of uh, rate changes, um, that's down here. Same thing, rate change is uh, small in the diastolic dysfunction mice and bigger with um, BH4, so almost all the reverse. And this is tissue Doppler to just show you the same thing. So um, giving hypertensive mice BH4 uh, completely or almost completely reverses their diastolic dysfunction. Um, so uh, how does it work? So let's, uh, I love this. this is, I mean, you're really lucky to have a Frank Gehry building right on campus. So it works either way. So one is a prevention model. You, you treat as you're developing the disease, uh, you don't get diastolic dysfunction. The other is a therapeutic model. You have diastolic dysfunction, and you treat them uh, both work. So I, I didn't show you that data, but they both work. Um, <clears throat> so this, so now we get down to myofilaments. We're going to get rid of the membrane. 
itself and just look at the myofilament contraction. So uh, the, the bottom line is there's no change in calcium sensitivity of the myofilaments. No significant calcium, a little bit, but not, not uh, particularly important. But there is a change in maximum ATPase rate and maximum tension production. So there is something going on at the, my, at the myofilament level that generates diastolic dysfunction. So not only is it isolated to the myocyte, it's isolated to the myofilaments. Um, so just to review uh, cardiac uh, myofilament topology or whatever that we want to call that. Um, uh, and, and I apologize to if any biochemists are in the room because they're like people like Dr. Thomas who are probably much more sophisticated than I am. Remember, I'm an electrophysiologist. I have no business studying that at all. Okay. Um, so there's actin and myosin. Myosin has these head chain head groups. They bind uh, when uh, all this troponin complex gets out of the way. Um, they bind to actin and pull it along, thus contracting the heart. Um, there's this protein here, which we're going to be focused on, this little blue guy that stretches between actin and myosin. This is called myosin binding protein C, um, and, and mutations in it are known to affect both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, some mutations associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, this is just to give you a little reminder of uh, myocyte biology, because I am going to show you that the presence of diastolic dysfunction is associated with oxidation. I've already showed you that. And it's associated with an oxidative modification of myosin binding protein C. So glutathione gets stuck to, by a disulfide bond, gets stuck to myosin binding protein C. Um, so uh, the mice that have diastolic dysfunction, otherwise known as DOCA, because that, that, that stands for the oxygocorticosterone acetate. It's an aldosterone analog. It's how we generate the hypertension. Um, and that, uh, so uh, there's increased glutathionalization of myosin binding protein C in all of the animals that have diastolic dysfunction. Um, so, um, the presence of this glutathionalization on myosin binding protein C is highly correlated with the presence of diastolic dysfunction. So, here is diastolic dysfunction. So, the higher you go, the more diastolic dysfunction you have. And uh, the more diastolic dysfunction you have, the more uh, glutathionylated myosin binding protein C you have. Um, if you reverse this glutathionalization, you also reverse the diastolic dysfunction. So it seems likely, although it's not absolutely proven, that, that this modification is um, functional, um, a functional part of diastolic dysfunction. Now, if all that I've said to you about hypertension is true, it should uh, also be true in other models of diastolic dysfunction that are induced by other methodologies. And so if you reflect back a few slides, uh, one of the other things that causes diastolic uh, dysfunction is diabetes. So um, I said, well, let's try diabetic model, see if, if it happens. Um, and you know, we need not speak of the relevance of this. Um, what I should have done here is put a picture of our state fair, because I'm pretty sure, uh, first of all, there's everything imaginable that's vaguely edible on a stick, and people are eating it. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, for guys been in Minnesota for three months, it was definitely immersion therapy. Um, so, uh, anyway, we took some mice and, and we fed them high fat. So, um, these mice get diabetes. Um, they get insulin resistant type two diabetes. So he, here's uh, a glucose tolerance test. They get increased glucose. that doesn't come down after 90 minutes. Um, they have kind of classic, uh, um, you know, metabolic syndrome type uh, outlook, they have increased body weight, increased body surface area, elevated uh, serum glucose, elevated uh, fasting glucose, um, and elevated fasting insulin. So they're diabetic. They're type 2 diabetic, right? Because type 1 wouldn't have insulin. Um, and, and these mice have diastolic dysfunction. Surprise, surprise. Um, so if you take E to E prime ratio, they have diastolic dysfunction. E to, uh, e to E prime, that was E prime to A prime, E to E prime, um, with no change in systolic motion of the mitral valve, or you know, as a measure of systolic function. Um, here are the, the tissue Dopplers. Here is the pressure volume loop, or representative pressure volume loops. Uh, the only changes in the in diastolic pressure volume relationship. So this is isolated diastolic dysfunction. 
Um, so the reviewers of the paper said, nah, we don't believe you. They always do. It's always reviewers. Too. And um, so they said, nah, no, 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 no. That's too easy. Go do it all again and measure, you know, 15 other parameters. So um, we did that. Here's the correlation between uh, um, cardiac MRI tagging uh, and uh, uh, in vivo hemodynamics. They're highly correlative. Here's the correlation between echocardiography and MRI. They're highly correlated. So it doesn't matter which technique you use. You get the same result, um, which is very disappointing to reviewers, but because they, they were certain that their technique was the best. Um, so it, you know, I had to um, inform them that it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> and you know, this is statistical histology to show you that there's nothing screwed up about the heart itself. There's no increased fibrosis or anything like that. So then we measured all the sources of oxidative stress and without being you know, excessively torturesome. Uh, there's um, uh, apocyanins for NADPH oxidase, uh, BH4s for uncoupled nitric oxide synthase, mitotempo is um, uh, for mitochondrially targeted um, uh, oxidative uh, stress. Um, so uh, the basic upshot of this was that mitochondria didn't produce that much oxidative stress in this model. Um, and and um, the, the biggest uh, producers included uh, nitric oxide um, synthase. Uh, but if you, uh, if you uh, well, I, I take that back, actually. I, I'm having a brain spasm. Um, the way you look at this is um, this is the maximum amount of superoxide production, and these are reductions. So the biggest reduction was inhibiting mitochondria, and the second biggest was inhibiting nitric oxide synthase. So I take that back. Sorry. I made an error there. Um, and, um, uh, oh, and I'm sorry, allopurinol blocks xanthine and xanthine oxidase. So um, it's also another source of superoxide production. Um, not only was there evidence that, that um, the mitochondria and nitric oxide synthase were screwed up, um, the mitochondrial membrane potential was depolarized. So normal myocytes, myocytes treated with BH4, Myocytes that have diastolic dysfunction because of diabetes, uh, and then myocytes treated with BH4, and the mitochondrial membrane potential returns to normal. So that suggests that there's a mitochondrial defect in, di in diabetes that's known, uh, and that this mitochondrial defect is highly correlated with the presence of diastolic dysfunction. And if you fix that, um, it gets better. It's not causative. It could um, uh, be, um, you know, a post post hoc. Um, Propter hoc fallacy, that is just too true and unrelated, uh, but it's suggested. Um, so the reviewers came back and said, well, why? Why does diabetes cause oxidative stress? And I said, you know, there's this whole field called endocrinology, and they've been sort of trying to do this for a long time. And you, you expect a cardiologist to give you this answer. Um, so, you know, this is really unfair, actually. But, you know, uh, no matter how many times you write that in a grant review, this is unfair. It doesn't help. So... Um, so I had to come up with some ideas about why there was increased oxidative stress um, in, in um, diabetes. And uh, I knew from other projects that if you increase the NADH to NAD plus ratio in cells, you will increase the amount of oxidative stress. Um, and we can go through how that works and what the signaling is and so on and so forth. And we're actually using that. We're using the NAD plus as a treatment for Brugada syndrome by raising sodium channels. And it all has to do with it. Mitochondrial oxidative stress, but um, in diabetic animals, there's increased uh, there's increased NADH as you might expect uh, with excess glucose hanging around, not uh, no change in NAD plus, and the ratios increased. That is consistent with the generation of of superoxide from mitochondria. It's not it's not um, a proof, but it's consistent with it. Um, mitochondria have ways of soaking up superoxide. Um, because they always are generating some. And, and their main way to do that is to use an enzyme called manganese SOD, uh, manganese superoxide dismutase. And manganese superoxide dismutase is regulated by acetylation. And um, if you are acetylated, if your manganese SOD is acetylated, um, it doesn't work very well. And if it's deacetylated, it works better. There are things called um, 
certs uh, that are deacetylases. And um, it turns out that uh, CERT3, which is in the mitochondria, is downregulated um, during uh, diabetes. That means that you don't uh, deacetylate very much. So as expected in diabetic uh, diastolic dysfunction, you have excess inactive manganese SOD. And that will get better if you treat the uh, heart cells with a mitochondrially targeted antioxidant. Um, so this was another potential reason why the mitochondria produce uh, too much silver oxide. I didn't get to the bottom line. Um, sorry, there's a whole field that's working on this. But I did give them the reviewer some ideas about why it might work. This is cardiac MR tagging to look at uh, diastolic dysfunction. So what happens is you look at displacement of a single little uh, point in the square here. Um, so as you'd expect with diastolic dysfunction and diabetes, the, the displacement is reduced. The rate is dis reduced. And if you treat these mice with a mitochondrially targeted antioxidant, um, the displacement returns to normal. This is diastolic displacement. So uh, diastolic function is bad in diabetic mice, and it gets better with uh, treatment with a mitochondrially targeted antioxidant. So uh, another um, potential therapy for diastolic dysfunction. Um, and I'd just like to point out one other thing that I don't fully understand yet, but is really, I think, kind of nifty and interesting. Um, these mice are diabetic. They get uh, hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, and if you inhibit mitochondrial oxidative stress, you know, hypertrophy goes back to normal. Kind of cool. um, so uh, I don't know what the hypertrophic signals are that are driving this. And I don't, uh, but obviously they involve something with re reactive oxygen which is uh, kind of a cool finding I, uh, we need to follow up on, but I haven't done that. Maybe Joe back there will help me because I, I don't understand anything about muscle. I mean, I'm an electrophysiologist. What do I care about muscle? Um, so uh, uh, as you would expect, uh, diabetic mice hearts are oxidized. So one thing that happens when you have too much superoxide floating around, you will make peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite will buy on tyrosine. This is a, an irreversible reaction to create nitrotyrosine. Uh, nitrotyrosine, there's an antibody for nitrotyrosine, so you can measure it as kind of a, an accumulated level of oxidative stress. So that's, that's what we did, and it's elevated in diastolic dysfunction. And if you inhibit, uh, if you use mitochondrially targeting antioxidant, you completely reverse it. So, um, or you prevent it because you can't reverse the modification. Um, again, yep, this is, <clears throat> so th I've shown you so far whole hearts. Uh, in whole animals, but this is single cells. So if you isolate the single cells, the contract, the relaxation phase of the single cell is slower than normal. Um, and that's uh, the length of uh, the sarcomere is uh, shorter, that is more contracted at diastole, and it's uh, improved with mitotempo. And the rate of relaxation is slower with diabetes and improved with mitotempo. So um, the defect um, in in these mice, in diabetic diastolic dysfunction, is at the level of the myocyte. Um, so I told you that I thought glutathionalization of myosin binding protein C was what caused diastolic um, dysfunction by uh, messing up the ability of the active myosin head bridges to relapse. Um, <clears throat> and consistent with that idea, although not um, proving it, um, in diabetes, there's an increased uh, glutathionalization of myosin binding protein C, and that's completely reversed by a mitochondrial targeted antioxidant. Um, so, um, and th these are just the Western blots to show the same idea. Um, so, again, there's um, this correlation between the presence of oxidized myosin binding protein C and the presence of diastolic heart failure. Um, there's also some other cool things that happened that, uh, uh, along the way. I, I, uh, I, you know, we've been using this mitochondrially targeted antioxidant, so mitochondria are probably screwed up. And, and this is just to show you these are untreated control animals. This is, these are diabetic animals. These are treated animals. Um, look at these mitochondria. They're kind of messed up. They have lots of vacuolization, and the Christie are kind of blunted and weird, um, and they get all back to normal when you treat them with the mitochondrially targeted antioxidant. So the mitochondria are definitely not structurally normal here. Um, and, uh, okay, the animals get fat when they get diabetes. They get increased glucose when they get diabetes. Um, they have uh, a, a poor 
um, or glucose tolerance tests. All the stuff that we would see in humans with um, with diabetes. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me anything hard though. Yeah. Well, there you go. So this is a diabetic animal that's fat, and a diabetic animal with mitotempo is not fat. Sure. I mean, diabetes is a systemic disease. I mean, whether this is directly on the myocardium or something else that's affecting myocardium, I can't tell you for sure. Although, the myocytes themselves, when isolated, have diastolic dysfunction. So... My guess is that what you're talking about is true, true, and unrelated. That is, that, that there are mitochondrial dysfunction in other places, and we know that. And, and mitotempo goes everywhere. So it, it's fixing the mitochondrial dysfunction, whatever, in the adipocytes or, or somewhere in your brain that's driving you to eat or whatever it is. Um, Yes, it could absolutely be that, and and my glossing over that uh, is only my own ignorance, not um, the fact that I don't understand there's a whole field that does this, and and that there could be other, you know, and that's why I like giving these talks because hopefully we can talk about it afterwards because I am, I, you know, I'm clearly not an expert in uh, metabolism or endocrinology or anything like that. And so um, these are pretty crude experiments by an electrophysiologist, and I'd love to refine them with somebody. I, I just don't know how to do that anymore. Than this. But I will point out one thing that I found really interesting and reviewers hated, um, which is when you treat people, the animals with mitotempo, you actually make their glucose tolerance test better. So you, um, you seem to have an anti-diabetic effect. Um, but I tell you, the reviewers went psycho over this. I, I'm like, it's data. You know, it's all. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it went against their grain that, that, that there was actually a therapy that would improve, you know, insulin release from, uh, from, from beta cells. Um, I, I just wanted to throw this in. This is some new data that we've been working on. So uh, I had a colleague, I was giving this talk, and I had a colleague come up and said, do you know that, that in fact, actually, uh, so this is epidemiology again. He said, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, and, and we've been looking at the, at <clears throat> magnesium intake in diabetes. Uh, and I'm sorry, in heart failure. And, and people that take in more magnesium have less heart failure. Went, okay. He said, well, maybe um, magnesium would help your mice. And I went, okay, let's see. Um, so uh, we did this protocol. We made them, you know, we made the mass, mice fat and diabetic. And, and then we treated them with magnesium sulfate. Um, and uh, really cool. I mean, magnesium is super duper cheap. I mean, you, you know, you can go to the store and get Maalox and get magnesium. And uh, look what happened. The, the, the control animals don't have much diabetes. The diabetic, the diabetic animals have almost 100% diastolic dysfunction. Sorry, diastolic dysfunction. 100% um, diastolic dysfunction. And if you treat the animals with magnesium, um, almost all of them go back to normal, which is... Super cool. I mean, it's unbelievably easy therapy um, to uh, improve uh, diastolic um, dysfunction. In, uh, you know, we didn't measure them, um, and I should have. So I, I can't answer you. Um, we just didn't do it. I didn't think about it. I, I should have. Um, sorry. Uh, my, me bad. Um, as you would expect, there's increased oxidative stress in the diabetic animals, and it's improved with magnesium. Um, you can measure that in mitochondria. You can measure that in generalized uh, superoxide production, or you can measure it in generalized uh, oxidative stress, measuring both superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Um, as you would expect, uh, the mitochondria are messed up. Um, so uh, this is a dye that measures my membrane potential of mitochondria. Uh, it, it, we normalize to one for the control group. The diabetic animals are depolarized. 
uh, as you would expect if mitochondria aren't happy. Um, and if you give them magnesium, they get happier, which is, is kind of cool. Um, so very simple therapy for uh, this disease. Um, and I don't know if there's any phones in the room, but you know, that's, a, that's a project you could do right now. I mean, you could go to the human clinic right now, pick out people with Godslaw, just want you to give magnesium, see what happens. Um, so, uh, you know, what I said to you was that there was excess glutathionalization of myosin binding protein C in the heart of animals that have diastolic dysfunction. Um, it also turns out that for reasons I don't understand, myocytes, when they get sick, begin to eject contractile proteins. Uh, and they show up in the serum. So you will see troponin uh, T and I, and this causes no end of consternation um, in the clinic because cardiologists are always getting called for these low-level troponins, and, and the vast majority of them have nothing to do with atherosclerotic disease. Um, and I think this is a stress response to the myocytes. Um, I don't know why they do it. I don't know how they do it. But they do do it, um, at least in, in our hands in, in culture. And um, so uh, the doco salt mice, the hypertensive mice that have diastolic dysfunction, they have elevated uh, myosin binding protein C, um, glutathionylated myosin binding protein C in their serum. Um, and uh, we measured this in humans, too. They have elevated um, myosin binding protein C glutathionalization in their serum. Now, we just finished a trial measuring 100 people trying to correlate um, the degree of diastolic dysfunction with the degree of uh, glutathionylated myosin binding protein C. So I'm hoping that this will end up being a human biomarker for the presence of diastolic dysfunction. And we could use this in asymptomatic people who are not are otherwise getting an echocardiogram to identify them and then potentially treat them with things like either BH4, or mitotempo, or, or magnesium. Um, so I think that this is, I'm hoping that this is a, a biomarker for diastolic dysfunction in humans. Yeah? Uh, we measured that as, um, so we didn't measure that as part of this trial, and we have measured that as part of the, um, the um, 100 person trial. Um, and uh, I will give you the answer as soon as we finish running the Western blots. So Pun over there is running the Western blots right now. And I forgot to, when I talked to you in lab meeting about that, I forgot to talk to you about running the systolic dysfunction model uh, uh, samples too, because we need to show that. Um, so um, I do have some preliminary data from before. Um, and I, I think I know what's going to happen. And I think what's going to happen is the systolic dysfunction people are also going to have glutathionylated myosin binding protein C. And the reason I think that happens, although I haven't proven it, is almost everyone with systolic dysfunction has diastolic dysfunction. So um, uh, I think we could, I'm hoping that we can make an even further step in the treatment of people with systolic dysfunction by treating the diastolic dysfunction too. Um, I haven't proven that, but I think that's why the, we see that elevation. So anyway. We'll see when we do the trial, um, the trial results. We also have another ongoing human trial of BH4 and um, diastolic dysfunction. And the results should be available um, sometime this fall. I mean, we're just finishing, um, finishing the enrollment uh, for that trial. Um, so what I told you was that hypertension or diabetes uh, cause oxidative stress. When you get that oxidative stress, you modify... Uh, myosin binding protein C and maybe some other things. Um, that uh, increases your sensitivity to calcium um, and your ability to relax independent of having elevated calcium, uh, diastolic calcium levels. Um, that impairs your stiffness and you get diastolic dysfunction. Um, and you can treat that with BH4. You can treat that with, uh, it turns out you can treat it with linolazine um, in the experiments I didn't show you. Uh, mitotempo, magnesium, a few other things. So um, you know, right now with the medicinal chemistry people, we're trying to make anal uh, pro drugs of BH4 that we can use in humans. So uh, be kind of fun. Uh, and um, so with that, I am going to stop. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, not only did you learn a little something about diastolic dysfunction, you had some fun with art. Uh, this is Rita Kahlo, in case you didn't recognize that. So, you know, this is a. Uh, the first 
cross circulation experiment in Mexico. Um, we did the first one in the United States down there in the BCR team. I think this is the second one in Mexico. Um, and, you know, like all lab directors, I don't really do anything. So um, I just think big thoughts and give talks and stuff like that. And, um, but these are all the people who really made these experiments happen. And, and I am really uh, pleased and honored that uh, four of my colleagues came with me um, from Providence. And one of them has, um, I owe a, a great debt of gratitude who's moved with me everywhere since I was in Atlanta. So um, pretty amazing. Um, and, and then some colleagues at the University of Illinois that also helped me understand my site biology. Now, um, we also need to have a little fun in life. And so I went to my son and I said, Nick, I think I've discovered this kind of cool thing. And he's like, OK, Dad. And I show him the slides. He's like, yeah, Dad, that's cool. And, and, and he says, but it's not new. And I said, what do you mean? He says, Dad, James Bond knew all about this stuff. And so let, let's see if... Too many free radicals. Is that your problem? Free radicals, sir? Yeah, they're toxins that destroy the body and the brain. Caused by eating too much red meat and white bread. Too many dry martinis. Then I shall cut out the white bread, sir. Oh, you'll do more than that, 007. From now on, you will be suffering a strict regimen of diet and exercise. We shall purge those toxins from you. Problems? You got it. Have you got an assignment, James? Yes. Yes, Money Penny. I'm to eliminate all free radicals. Oh. Do be careful. <laughs> so, we are to eliminate all free radicals. Um, so he was right. You know, here we are, what, 1960s and or se early 70s, and they already knew all this stuff. So anyway, um, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, hopefully we can do some good science together. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. <clears throat> All right, if there's no questions, we can just all go back to doing what we're doing. Any questions? Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's, we're pretty crude at these measurements because we're not metabolic guys and they weren't in a metabolic cage. So um, I don't know that for sure. Um, they seem to, be on net average, eat the same number of pellets, but that's about the best I can do. Um, I have no idea. Um, I don't know if you saw, but the... Um, not only did it affect body weight, it also affect myocardial weight, uh, myocardial hypertrophy. And I think this is super interesting. I just haven't had the time or skill to follow up on it, and I don't know why it happens. So, uh, no, the control mice had no effect. So, it's something specific to diabetes and, and whatever else is going on. Uh, yes, sir. So, um, so I think the simple answer to those is we don't know. So, um, in order to do those experiments, you would have to really do MRI. MRI, looking for extracellular volume, fibrosis to gadolinium enhancement plus um, tagging to look at diastolic dysfunction. No one I know has done that. Um, 
as I said early on, there are at least two types of diastolic dysfunction. One is fibrotic and age-related, and one is functional in kids. Um, how much they overlap in humans is unclear to me, and I think unclear to anyone else that I know. And I don't think there's great epidemiology on this. So I, I don't know. I think, I think that's very likely. Um, that it's two diseases, and they may they may overlap on each other, um, or they may progress with each other. I mean, Maggie's shown very clearly that, that diastolic dysfunction seems to progress, and then you eventually progress into overt heart failure. Um, uh, a small percentage of people, I mean, only about 10% of people have diastolic dysfunction ever get heart failure, but it's enough. Um, so it's, you know, 250,000 new people a year, so... So it, it um, I don't know. I mean, these are great questions, and and we need to study this condition more. And whether it is reversible or not, once you have established heart failure, may not be. I mean, that's why you might want to focus in the in the um, so the preclinical phase, the latent phase, where they have diastolic dysfunction in the absence of systolic dysfunction. There's also um, there, there is right now an anti-fibrotic um, agent that's out there in the universe, um, and maybe that would be helpful in addition for treatment. You know, this is just one idea. It's not, I, mean, I have no illusion that this is going to cure all diastolic heart failure. Um, it's just uh, one possibility early on in a couple of conditions, but I, I suspect we have a very heterogeneous population that's going to require more effort. Um, right? Even our systolic function um, treatments don't work equally in everybody. So, you know, at, at some level there's heterogeneity there too. So, um, so yes, well, up for debate. I mean, it, you know, I'm a guy from outside the field who just looks at it a little differently than Dr. Westfield does. Uh, actually, yeah, oh, Yap left. He had to go. But I, I, we talked about inviting Dr. Redfield here to give a talk, and I, I don't know if we're doing too soon. Um, uh, okay, any, yes? Uh, um, the answer is no. There are nine potential sites. So um, mass spec suggests three sites change with the presence of heart failure. Um, so uh, uh, we're just starting to do mass spec here to try to isolate which one it might be that's contributing disease. Um, uh, so we just don't have an answer yet. So there are nine possible sites in the room. My, um, my, my question is There's nine systems. So, um, hmm? I don't know that. Um, I, I haven't thought about that or done that analysis. Uh, I guess what you're asking me is, is there, is there a cysteine, modification, a cysteine mutation, inherited mutation that gives you myopathy? I, I don't know. But, you know, think about it. If it, was a, if it was a cysteine modification such that cysteine no longer existed, you wouldn't get glutathionalization, so you'd actually protect yourself against diastolic dysfunction rather than generate diastolic dysfunction. So you, you need a, you know, there isn't a, a good converse experiment. You know, it's something that mimics glutathionalization as a mutation. So I'm not sure that that would entirely answer the question. There are, there are inherited mutations of myosin binding protein C that have mostly diastolic dysfunction phenotypes. So um, it, it is conceivable that you mess with myosin binding protein C and get diastolic dysfunction. You can also get hypertrophic heart 